Welcome, everybody. I'm Josh Horowitz, the Executive Director of the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. For those who don't know the Educational Fund, uh, we are our mission, the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, uses a public health and equity lens to identify and implement evidence-based policy solutions to stop gun violence. We also implement these policies and we work at the community level as well. We seek to make gun violence rare and abnormal. Today, we're gonna to have a very timely discussion on micro-stamping um, and we're excited that you could join us and we're gonna have a great panel as well. Um, for anybody who knows me, they know that I'm always talking about micro-stamping, something I'm kind of obsessed with. Um, and so I've been working on this with some of the other folks here for quite a long time. But the question is, why are we releasing a report today? What's new? What's different? What do we need to do? And I think there's a couple of things that animate the need to get this thing done. Number one, we've seen a dramatic rise in homicides and unsolved shootings. And that demands a robust response in many ways, but also includes identifying where the guns are coming from. And that's something microstamping will really help with. And number two, because of a focus on making the technology commercially available for turnkey operations, it has never been easier for firearms manufacturers to deploy this technology into their products, which is why our recommendations in this report, which we will get into, are solely aimed at forcing manufacturers to deploy this technology that could save lives. Microstamping is really simple, okay? It's a simple technology that, imp that imprints a microscopic code on every expended cartridge case. It works the same way a license plate does, a simple alphanumeric code that can give you the make, the model, the serial number, the owner sometimes. It's just like a license plate. It gives you information from the expended cartridge case from a firearm, even when you don't have that gun. It's a technology that can solve gun-related crimes, identify gun traffic ne trafficking networks, and reduce gun violence. Now, for, thank you for all joining us. I know, I assume that people have questions. I hope people have questions. There is a Q&A box at the bottom. Please put your questions in there throughout the panel, um, and then I will do my best to ask questions of our panelists uh, as we move forward, but please take it, take advantage of that and, and um, put your questions in, in the box, in the Q&A box. Now, I'm looking forward to moderating this conversation. I'm passionate about it, but I'm lucky to find other colleagues who are passionate about it as well. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful panel. And I hope people walk away from this understanding the technology, but also feeling the way that they have the power to go advocate for this as well. And understanding that is, is part of that. So I'm joined by a great panel. Uh, we're going to walk through um, a number of factors about microstamping, and I hope you learn a lot today. Um, Ari Davis from our, our team is going to talk about what it is and why it matters. Ari is a senior policy analyst at the Educational Fund. His primary focus area is addressing community gun violence through effective policy and programs. Ari earned a Master's of Public Policy at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2018. And being a glutton for punishment, he is now pursuing a Doctor of Public Health uh, at the same uh, university, focusing on violence prevention. Uh, we also have the co-inventor of microstamping, Todd Lazat. Todd's an entrepreneur, inventor, and laser micro, micro machining technologist. Todd's micro machining innovations have been applied directly to the fields of firearms forensics and many other fields. Todd is the president and CEO of TAC Labs. Todd manages the micro stamping engineering team at TAC Labs. Um, one of, one of uh, somebody I've done a lot of work with over the last number of years uh, is Assistant Chief Oren Gallup. Um, he has been uh, in law enforcement for 27 years, serving with the Hampton Police Department. And he will talk about some of the forensic benefits uh, of microstamping technology. Um, we've worked with uh, Assistant Chief Gallup and, and Johns Hopkins University to author the Community Empowerment to Reduce Violence or SERVE initiative, a program geared towards reducing gun-related violent crime. Um, and then our fourth panelist is Cami Chavis. Uh, Cami is an expert in police community relations and criminal justice reform. 
She's professor at Lake at, of Law and director of the Criminal Justice Program at Wake Forest School of Law. She's a vice, also a vice provost at Wake and a special advisor to, the, to me, the executive director of the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. As a former assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, Cami's litigation experience serves as a cornerstone to her scholarship in criminal justice and criminal procedure. Cami is a leader in criminal justice reform and consults on matters of police and prosecutorial accountability, federal hate crimes legislation and enforcement, and racial profiling. Ari's going to start, but before I do that, while he puts his slides up, I will, um, I, I will, um, I, I will definitely um, encourage everybody to put their Q and A in the in the in the box, and we will get to some of those questions. So Ari, um, I'm going to. Uh, I see some questions already coming in, uh, which I was a little distracted, um, but I know Ari, you're going to deal with some of those first questions. So jump right in. Um, and uh, get going and uh, looking forward to having this great discussion. Thank you, Ari, uh, uh, for, for getting us going. Great, thanks, Josh. I'm excited to be here and um, really excited about the release of this new report. And um, so the first thing I'm gonna um, talk through is just an overview of what microstamping is. I'm gonna show some images and then talk about the framing of the report and why microstamping is so, could be such a strong tool to help um, solve cases and um, potentially reduce gun violence. So, so I'm going to briefly give an overview of the current ballistic analysis um, techniques that are used. Um, and so you can see here, this is a little diagram of a, of a firearm. You can see that the firing pin, when a gun is fired, the firing pin hits the cartridge casing. Um, and it leaves unintentional markings on the um, cartridge casing. So as the cartridge casing is um, expended um, and law enforcement uh, arrive to the scene of a shooting, they can recover that uh, shell casing, that cartridge casing, and they can look at those unintentional marks that are left on that cartridge casing. They can then try to link those unintentional marks. They can look under a microscope and try to link it to other cartridge casings to see similarities and, and matches in terms of the, um, the markings. Um, but to link the cartridge casing to a specific firearm, they have to recover a firearm, um, test fire the firearm, and then see if those um, markings match, right? Um, and so they can, so this image here shows um, what appears to be a match. So micro stamping uses the same kind of mechanics and the same process, um, but it intentionally marks um, with a stamp on each cartridge casing as um, the gun is fired. So you can see here, uh, a code is etched into the tip of the, the firing pin. And as the firing pin hits the cartridge casing, it imprints that code onto um, the cartridge. So this allows law enforcement to be able to collect that cartridge and immediately um, look under a microscope and link it to a specific gun without necessarily recovering the gun itself. Um, so this can provide um, vital leads um, to, to identify where that firearm came from and the first purchase of that firearm. Um, and as Josh mentioned in the intro, it's kind of like a license plate um, for a car, right? So when you see an image of a license plate, you can make a link between that license plate and, and uh, law enforcement could identify the, the VIN number, the identification number of the car and gain key um, intel. So as you can see here is an image under a microscope of, of a micro stamped shell. Um, and what's interesting about this is this is an image after test firing the gun um, over 8,532 8, times. Um, and this is the, this is the, the, the shell casing after it's been, been, been um, fired that many times. So it shows that this technology um, can withstand um, you know, thousands and thousands of rounds of, of firing. And Todd, I'm sure I'll get into more of the specifics as we, as we go. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit around um, the framing of our report and how we see this technology um, being a huge asset to, to solving gun crimes and shootings and um, potentially reducing community gun violence. 
So as, as many of you may, may be well aware, um, interpersonal gun violence disproportionately impacts black and brown communities um, in under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, and so I, we pulled a stat from the recently released CDC data um, that kind of illustrates this, that um, black boys and men ages 15 to 34 make up only 2% of the population, but account for 37% of all homicide um, victims. Um, when we look at when we look at the um, unsolved, uh, when we look at the who is most impacted by unsolved gun shootings and gun homicides, um, the same uh, communities that are disproportionately impacted by gun violence are uh, often um, the, the shootings and gun homicides are often unsolved, remain unsolved. So a recent analysis looked at cities, um, major cities. Um, found that only 35% of firearm homicides and 21% of firearm assaults um, were solved when the victim was Black uh, or Hispanic. Um, and these are much lower, uh, about 15 percentage points lower than when the victim is um, white. So you have this crisis of um, daily gun violence and of unsolved shootings. And um, what happens is when you, know, when you have uh, you know, the majority, the vast majority of shootings uh, not being resolved. Um, there's no closure for the survivors and loved ones um, within that community. And that can erode trust um, with law enforcement um, and legitimacy. Because if folks don't see, um, you know, the most serious crimes being uh, solved within their community, they may not rely on those formal channels of justice. They may, um, seek, uh, reta may seek retaliatory violence or, or justice on their, on their own. And so this can fuel cycles of violence. Um, and then the other thing to note is that guns um, that are, are, are used in most of these crimes are often trafficked into these communities um, by traffickers, dealers, um, and the industry. And um, that uh, those folks are rarely held accountable for, um, you know, even though they can sometimes be involved in, 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 in some ways in, in, in trafficking. So microstamping is just one tool that can help um, address this crisis of unsolved shootings, right? So it provides law enforcement with quick, they can respond to a shooting and they can quickly um, upload the microstamp codes and identify the serial number of the specific gun that was used. And this can generate leads um, both in terms of uh, the suspect um, and it can connect different shootings across a city, but it can also help um, identify where these guns came from and try to uh, identify those trafficking channels and hold um, those traffickers accountable. Um, one thing to note, which um, I'm sure will be talked about more as, as, as the panel goes, is that this tool is unobtrusive, right? It doesn't um, collect large amounts of data um, and it only really provides data when that gun is fired. Um, and it's focused on specifically on the shootings um, and it provides that objective evidence um, that can be used, a specific link to a firearm that can be used um, to help resolve this, this crisis. So uh, as Josh talked about, we're really excited about the new um, developments in technology and um, Todd will uh, you know, go into detail here, but um, we're just really excited that there is um, a machine tool that's commercially available um, and that this uh, important technology can really be incorporated into that manufacturing process um, and it's ready for, for mass production. So we're really excited about this technology and, and you know in this um, there is this release of this report is just to kind of uh, to highlight this powerful potential as uh, microstamping as a tool to help um, address these um, these crises. Um, so I encourage everybody to, to take a look at our website and download the new um, the new report that we released uh, today. And uh, I'm really excited for uh, this panel and to take any questions that, um, that you all may, may have. Thanks. Well, Ari, right, thanks a lot. I've already got some questions for you, um, but I'm gonna go to, I'm going to go to Todd, who I like the fact that he's sort of sitting in front of the machines in the manufacturing floor. So tell us what's going on, Todd. That looks like, you know, looks serious what you're doing there. 
I don't know about serious, but uh, this is uh, the uh, production facility uh, for building uh, the TAC Labs, uh, what we call the IFM platform, which is a machine tool. Uh, we've been refining this uh, technology, uh, you, know, you know, Josh, since 1993, um, up until now. Uh, uh, the uh, technology behind me, uh, you can see is, uh, uh, and there's two of the machines here. One's an automated version uh, for palletizing, for high volume manufacturing. And another is a uh, configured for um, basically loading a, a, a pallet in uh, for lower volume applications. And, uh, but these are turnkey systems. Uh, these are systems that we've built for, for the last 30 years. I've built these similar systems that occupy the plant floors of, from uh, semiconductors to uh, medical devices uh, to uh, heck even uh, 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 plants that make uh, different types of uh, food products. Uh, so these, this technology is ready to roll. And, uh, and I wanted to highlight it behind me because it's a uh, it's a milestone in, in terms of the technology development. Uh, let's go back just kind of the history of, of micro stamping in general. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up this, the story where this started. I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, but uh, back in 1993, uh, the company uh, that I had was uh, building technology for the next generation of high density interconnect. And what does that mean? It was an enabling technology for what you guys, uh, you have daily, uh, cell phones and stuff of that nature. That was 1993. And uh, we were uh, keeping what we call keeping track or keeping pace with the Intel's roadmap of technological development for this high density connections. And uh, I wanted to do an advertisement. And I, I went to my marketing person and, and she came back to me and said, um, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to have a cartridge head stamp because I'm a, I'm a firearms guy. I, I, I enjoy uh, target shooting and, and such, but I figured a ah, nice head stamp. I told her I want the, want the title to say, the company at the time was a company called Nanovia. I said, Nanovia is on track, to, on target to hit the Intel roadmap for high density interconnect. And that's really how it began. And she mocked up something with the logo on the primer. And I looked at it and I said, you really did a good job, but you know what? I, th I think I can do this with my uh, SIG. So I took the pin out, I went into my lab and I micro-machined the logo on the tip of the pin, brought it to the range, fired off a few rounds, took a SEM image of that cartridge with our logo on it, and we put it into that marketing campaign. Uh, later on, a colleague of mine wanted me to do a discussion about it at a conference, which I did. And at that point I was, I was broached, I, the question was placed to me, could this be have benefit to forensics? Um, I'm a technologist, so I understand when people ask questions like that and so direct and blunt that the, the, it quickly went through my head and said, yes, yes, it has benefit for forensics. And that's really where it started off. And we carried it forward from 1993. Now, through that history till now, of course, we've, we've had these situations where we had all these shootings. Columbine was one of the first ones that uh, was nationalized, I think, um, Sandy Hook, uh, even just recently with Las Vegas. And as the years gone by, we've been testing more and more. So all the firearms that we test, we call them test vehicles, uh, have in excess of 8,000, some have almost up to 10,000 rounds. Um, new technology we've created for accelerated lifetime testing. We actually take firing pins and we rapidly uh, tap them into uh, brass stock, which is equivalent to the primer material. And we go upwards of 50,000 cycles. And what that does is accelerates the lifetime testing. And that's more of an engineering technique um, because uh, you know it, it's firing off 50,000 rounds of ammo per firearm is just not viable. And what we really want to do is we want to look at the longevity of the pin under the same conditions. And, uh, and, and so we have all these techniques. And our technology has evolved to a point, I think in the presentation that Ari showed, that firing pin is amazing in terms of its, its uh, surface finish and its, and its capability. It does not change the, uh, the, the metallurgy on the pin and it has a very long lifetime. So we're very excited about that, that technology. Um, and that's kind of the a, a nutshell, the evolution. I'm gonna just add one more thing to this. It, the technology itself is leveraging a hundred years of unintentional micro stamping, which is the 
the the leftover tooling marks that are on the on the uh, uh, that are uh, left in, during the manufacture of the firearm that have been the basis of firearms examination and evidence uh, uh, for oh, I'd say over a hundred years. All we've done is created intentional tooling marks, and we leverage the same infrastructure uh, from the forensic community. We leverage the same. Uh, infrastructure from law enforcement. We leverage the same infrastructure for the manufacture of the equipment right behind me. All of this is basically uh, a, a phrase called combinatorial innovation. All I've done is pulled together innovation from various different areas and combined them together. But each one of those areas upon itself has an established, uh, you know, a record uh, of over, you know, many numbers of, of, of uh, decades and up to a century. Uh, so this technology is solid, it's turnkey, it's ready to put, be put into action, and I look forward to it uh, being applied and helping law enforcement uh, combat firearm trafficking. Thank you. No, Todd, thank you for being here. Really very, very appreciative of that and all the work you've done on this. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, so um, also appreciative of our law enforcement partners. Uh, so Assistant Chief Gallup, we've talked over many, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about violence prevention, about fire prevention. You've been, a, you know, really strategic. Uh, we've thought a lot about work and some of the work we've done together and work, you've thought hard about stopping gun violence. When we talked about this, this is something that you really wanted to lean into. Tell us a little bit about why that is and wh why this can make a big difference. Okay. As you know, in law enforcement, five minutes for us is hard to talk. So I'm still trying to take my time. Um, when we look at one of our biggest issues in is, uh, is that we're not having more shooters. It's normally the same people who are doing crime over and over again. And is that we normally know who the suspects are. Some, uh, but uh, one of our problems also has been is that having people willing to come forward to testify in court. Technology give us the ability to, to where the more evidence we can present, sometimes it can eliminate that process. Currently, we use the NIVIN system, which is a good system, but one of the drawbacks with NIVIN is that if we don't have the firearm, we can't identify where the shell casing came from. So you have to have the casing and the firearm. There are a lot of nights sometimes we can find, go out where you may see 20, 30 shell casings they get fired or you have people who have um, reports of um, shots fired. We can go and recover the shell casings. We can run them into our knife and system. But if the firearm has already been in the system, we can't identify where the um, casing came from. Uh, with micro stamping, what that does, we don't need to know, um, we don't have to go through all that because the weapon already be identified. So once we have that stamp, it saves us so much time in our investigation where we already know this is where the firearm um, is this is who the purchaser is and we can automatically tell us certain things has the um, person that purchased the firearm had they purchased from different places had the um where they um buying it from is this a seller that is selling to particular groups or is there any type of pattern so it gives us that also it saves us a lot of time on the investigation it helps us on the amount of time we have to detain somebody when we're doing the investigation we'll still need a knife and system because it's pre-existing Farms that we will need knifing and we will still need those technologies. Micro stamping will be good for all the new weapons coming in that we we'll automatically know. Even with technology, what I would tell everyone is that technology by itself won't solve a problem. You need to have a fully type integrated system where you have the prevention side of it, the education intervention. What a technology do, it will enhance your entire system. So when you have a fully integrated system, the technology will improve it. Um, one of the things that we're finding from gun violence is the trauma it brings with it. And so once we have um, a crime committed by a gun has a more traumatic effect on a community. And what we didn't understand or what we understand more is from those types of crimes where we're seeing that it affects people who weren't directly related witnesses. Um, even in the school, people who just see a body has an effect on them. So micro stamp anything that can do the short amount of time of investigation and identify is so much better and also even in our interrogations it matters so much to already know this is where the weapon came from this is the person it saves us so much time to know that purchaser and also a problem we had across the country 
a lot of people don't report their weapons are stolen. Um, I think it was in our city, I can say for us at one point, almost um, it was close to the majority of our weapons were stolen out of people's vehicles and the vehicles were unlocked. So we didn't know until after the crime, something happened today, you report, oh yeah, my gun was stolen. At least with the micro staffer, that's something an obstacle we don't have to worry about because we already know even if a person didn't report their weapon as stolen, we'll already know that this is the weapon that we use. So it saves us on that. Um, I'm looking forward to having that technology come into online because for us is that any technology we have is beneficial. And the way I look at it is that even though it will, you know, you still will need the systems like NIBIN, micro stamping, they're kind of almost enhanced. And it's almost a natural evolution of it. You have this one, then micro stampers, more or less, the future is going to take another step further. So I look at all of them as beneficial to the whole myriad of what we're trying to do with put together that whole um, kind of, I say, system of gun violence prevention. Thank you so much, Assistant Chief. Really appreciate you being here. Um, and I think it's great that I'm glad that there's, there's definitely law enforcement use for this and it's nice to hear that. Um, of course, th at the same time, we wanna make sure that it's balanced and fair um, and, the, and that um, it's, it's narrow, narrowly tailored for its intended purpose and doesn't have other negative consequences. Um, and someone who's thought a great deal about that in, in technology in general in law enforcement is Kemi Chavis. So uh, Kemi, why don't you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about microstamping and a little bit about your work. Great, thank you, thank you, Josh. Um, I wanna talk about um, this technology of, of microstamping and how it comes at a time when we are experiencing a need for greater uh, reform and accountability and transparency in our criminal justice system. Um, so as a former prosecutor, I think it's really important to understand how um, the lack of legitimacy that, that Ari talked about earlier, the lack of legitimacy in our criminal justice system, the things that we do on the front end, how they can impact and hinder justice um, and public safety on the back end. Um, and in sometimes, in some instances, lead to increased violence. So um, again, first, you know, we can, uh, the, the death of, of George Floyd is widely seen as a spark for um, some of the, the recent waves of, of reforms and calls for transparency, but truly, these tensions um, and criticisms about our criminal justice system um, are historical and ha are deeply rooted in our country. And we can't really talk about the, the criminal justice system and solving crimes in some of these impacted uh, communities um, if we don't uh, talk about the impact that the, the system as a whole has uh, on, uh, on, on communities uh, of color. Um, and so it's been really difficult for some of the most impacted communities to forge the necessary partnerships and collaborations with their uh, law enforcement uh, agencies to investigate and address uh, gun violence. Um, and so in order to address um, the harm that, that gun violence causes um, in, in these communities, um, we have to understand some of the underlying reasons um, that impede uh, violence. And so um, when we think about, and, and here's just um, an idea, when we think about, um, a, there's a recent uh, Pew uh, research study that said um, Black Americans are about five times as likely as whites to say that they've been unfairly stopped by the uh, police because of their race or ethnicity. Um, there are also striking, distance, uh, striking differences when we're talking about um, the, blacks and whites and how they uh, feel that the, whether the criminal justice system uh, treats them uh, fairly. Um, it, blacks are su substantially less likely to say um, that their local police do an excellent job in protecting people from crime. So we have to understand um, that this is happening and then understand uh, how can we um, how can we better work with uh, law enforcement agencies um, and so um, you might say well what does any of this have to do with micro standing with the with the technology um, and and I would say that all of this all of these attitudes um, are exacerbated uh, by the fact that a lot of times when we try to remedy, these problems, remedy these tensions um, uh, between these communities. Um, e a lot of the accountability measures and even some of the reform measures themselves can be more intrusive 
for these communities um, and you know, further leading to um, a lack of, of trust. So what we see in the, in, in, again, Ari's statistics at the beginning um, of the, the talk are, are interesting because what we see is the most impacted communities have the lowest clearance uh, rates. And these are also some of the communities that experience the most heavy uh, surveillance, uh, police uh, surveillance, um, active uh, surveillance. So in many ways, the same communities that are most impacted, the crimes are unsolved, um, and they're experiencing a lot of direct um, uh, impact with uh, law enforcement that doesn't always work out uh, well. And so when we um, think about some of the other technologies, and I'll just say that, you know, the uh, President Obama's 21st century task force on policing talked about the importance that technology can play um, with public safety, but that same task force reminded us that we have to be careful with technologies. Um, and so I'll say from in the beginning that I think that micro stamping does not have some of the problems that other technologies have. Um, and again, I'll just, when we think about even something like body-worn cameras um, that capture video, audio inside of, of people's homes, um, witnesses, uh, folks that might be there. Um, again, um, gunshot detection uh, software, very uh, powerful in terms of um, solving crimes, but very problematic in some ways when it captures uh, innocent um, behavior and then uh, whatever's captured on the, the, the audio there can be used um, against someone who's not even involved in, um, in the, the gun crime or in the gun violence. So um, that is all to say that a lot of times technologies can be over-inclusive, um, used um, in these communities, uh, over-inclusive, wrapping up more people than we need to, to solve crime. And that over-inclusiveness, um, again, uh, harms the, the trust and harm, can harm the relationship. So with micro-stamping, I think this is really promising technology because those, same, those concerns that I raised are not present here. Um, unlike the other technologies, um, you know, micro-stamping becomes relevant only once that cartridge is uh, expended. Um, and so it's not over-inclusive um, in that way. And we just can't underestimate um, how laser-focused, and pardon the pun here, but how laser-focused this technology is when it comes to solving crimes. And so it has to be, uh, again, narrowly tailored. You're going to, once this cartridge is expended, um, then it's all about tracing um, the, you know, helping to solve the crime that occurred, um, identifying the gun trafficking uh, networks, helping to reduce uh, gun violence, but it is narrowly tailored. And so we're not sweeping up uh, individuals who just ha happen to, to be around and may not be involved um, in this crime. Uh, so, um, and that, um, I can say, again, as a former prosecutor, we have um, a number of people, and the assistant chief mentioned it too, that they don't want to talk about what's happened or what they've seen. Um, and so here, this, this cartridge um, is speaking. The cartridge is going to speak for itself. So thank you. Amy, thank you so much for that. And uh, thanks, to, thank you to this great panel. I, 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 I've learned something and I hope others have. Um, and I really appreciate your expertise and I appreciate the different perspectives will come together, I think, as a whole here to make this seem like an important, I hope people think it's important and robust technology. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to synthesize some of what I'm hearing to some questions that are repetitive in the chat, but I'm going to, we're going to try to get through as many as we can in the next 25 minutes. Um, so um, one that always comes up, um, uh, Todd, is is the cost of all this. So what do we what are we looking at? I mean, let's let's. I want to be clear that our recommendations in the report are for states to patent and federal government to pass laws to ensure the manufacturers implement this technology. So I assume there's a, there will be a cost there, um, but um, tell us about that because the estimates I've seen have been it's a very reasonable expense. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it basically goes depending on manufacturer. You have. Uh, niche manufacturers that do custom firearms and so forth that might have a smaller lot size um, per year, uh, where you, then you have ma uh, manufacturers who supply uh, law enforcement or even the uh, Department of Defense. And uh, you could see a considerable volume there. 
ARM machine tools are just that, machine tools. So they fall into that uh, realm of CNC tools, which these companies purchase every year. Um, but let's just look at from a per pin cost, say for firing pins. Um, you're talking a range between 50 cents and $5. Wow. And 50 cents is the high volume manufacturers. And I believe that the technology could go probably just a hair lower than that. But let me, let me kind of put that in perspective. Um, I buy firing pins now from manufacturers that range anywhere from, you know, $30 a firing pin, which on the low end, um, upwards of $125 for a high end uh, firearm. Now, um, those, a lot of those pins can be manufactured on what we call a Swiss screw machine, which is a type of machine that turns down metal. I've gotten a quote on a, on a, on a 1911 pin, and I can get those in quantities of 1,000 units uh, for 87 cents a piece. So you can, the manufacturer, and that's me going to a second, a third party and telling them, I need a thousand pins, here's my design, 87 cents a piece. So, you know, you can, the, the reality of it is our technology is, 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 my, is a minor cost when you talk about the benefits um, uh, for it. And uh, so that kind of gives you perspective. Um, it's a very cost effective. Well, it sounds like a small, small cost to play for safety. That's what it seems. That's what it seems to me, considering firearms in general can be hundreds, sometimes even more, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars, even more. So that's that's good to know that it's, it's, it seems to be affordable within that. Ari, I've got some questions about the legislative landscape. You want to feel comfortable jumping in on California and just saying, talking about what's gone on there? Or do you want me to jump in on that? Sure. Happy to. Um, so, yeah, California, this. Uh, a couple months ago, um, updated. So they had a, they passed a bill um, about 15 years ago um, requiring microsampling on new models of, of firearms in, in the state. Um, and that was tied up for a little while um, on some, some there's some litigation and, and some other aspects, but it, then the fire manufacturers just refused to bring new models to market. So they just sold new firearms in California, but old models. And so that's what they've been doing to avoid um, this, uh, this law. So the new California law um, provides incentives for manufacturers to bring um, new models of micro stamps, um, micro stamping equipped firearms to market in California. Um, so for every, so California is a little wonky, but it has a roster of um, approved firearms. And so for every um, new model of a firearm um, that's equipped with micro stamping. Uh, three, I believe it's three uh, old models are removed from the from the from the roster. So essentially, it creates this competition to to get um, micro stamping uh, equipped models to to market. Um, but there is uh, interest in other states to 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 kind of uh, avoid the pitfalls of of what happened in California and just require it on all new manufactured um, semi-automatic pistols after a certain date. Um, and so um, yeah. that's, that's, that's been our recommendations. And we've seen uh, and we've seen some of these bills introduced in other states. We won't go into each, each state's detail, but uh, we do know there's some interest in other states and we're looking forward to working with those states with some of this new information. And of course, I hope people on this call will say, hey, I'd like to I'd like to talk to my home state legislatures about this and maybe even Congress. So thank you. Thank you for that, Ari. Um, Chief, you talked about crime solving. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about how this fits into, you talked about, you know, in, integrating other technologies. You, tell us a little bit how microsampling may fit in into your sort of ge more general idea of where the guns are coming from. Like what else does microsampling offer? How does it get integrated into the, into the type of work that you're doing already beyond just solving crimes? Okay. Like I said, a big important for us is a lot of times we gather that data on to gun trafficking to find out where the weapon is coming from and how long it takes from, you know, like say from time to crime also, to look at if, um, where the, when the weapon's been used. And one of the big problems we're having things like this is lack of reporting of um, stolen weapons and what we find out later, things like that. Um, but also I look into also integrating to um, a whole system of what we have using technology, uh, human intelligence, and also the technology part of it which makes it a, a lot better system. Um, what I tell everybody is that there's no panacea to what we're doing, is that I, I don't want to give anybody illusion that 
one thing will solve your problem when it comes to um, violent crime. It takes a full system. What microscapping does, it's, it's one more building block what we need into putting the whole system together. And like what we do, and it also it creates types of partnership, like what we do with us in Hampton, where our sister city is Newport News. So what we do is that we share an item system together so it help reduce the cost because crime goes across timeline um, jurisdictions. And also we put together a, a type of crime initiative where we um, look at it where we know that for us, most of our crime is our violent crime in our city, I can speak for our jurisdiction has been young black males. They're the victims, the suspects. And it starts that we look at different ways to intervene at the ages and by the time we arrest someone, they've already used a gun multiple times. And what we're trying to prevent is that by the time we actually catch the person, they've already committed other crimes. And the first crime is always the hardest to commit. And by the time we get to you and different things, and hopefully the uh, micro stamp, it gives a quicker uh, intervention point where we do it. It gives their intervention point to where even if we have it, you know, when we do it, we can get an intervention point then we can look at the other services that we can use to help prevent other types of crimes from being committed. And also even on, um, strictly for us, we look at it and how I've always looked at it with us is that when anything happens, we always look at law enforcement. Law enforcement, we always talk about, we can't be the sole solution uh, whenever a problem comes, but we definitely do like for you to give us all the money. <laughs> we don't mind using when you go there, but I've always been, if we have things like micro staffing that technology, you can have more like public safety packages. Instead of giving us 10 officers, then you could give us, say, why don't you give us five officers? Maybe we can do three or four teachers, mental health professionals. And then that way, whenever you go before council, it's not just the police chief, it's the police chief, the school superintendent, everybody together. And then we have that technology. All of us kept contribute where it's not just police responsibility, it is not just like the local government response on that type of technology. All of us are in together. So when you look at that type of purchase, it's kind of a whole type of system where you say that this technology pays for this many officers or it does that. So I look at the whole technology as something to where as when you integrate an entire package together, it's easier to promote. When you say, if you just say that this is strictly for this, it's not as easy if you say that this is part of our entire package. And this is how the package goes. This is how it works with how many counselors we not go. This is how many work with teachers. This is how it works with law enforcement. So once we put together the package and you articulate it that way, it makes everything better. And also it keeps all of us to way that where one group doesn't take all the money from the other groups and it becomes more of a, a partner sharing. Well, that's one of the things I've enjoyed working with you is your your, your your department's focus on prevention. And so one of the reasons we really do enjoy working with you is that focus on the holistic approach of prevention. So uh, thank you for enunciating that. That was great. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Cami, going to you, um, there's a really interesting part of that discussion, which is you, well, your discussion made me think about license plate readers. So we talked about them being like license plates. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized that license plate readers collect data on everybody right? Who's driving by where micro stamping is a lot more narrow. Is that what you're getting at? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like get right. Yes. So when you have some of these, and, and also too, just want to, um, I, I love listening to what the, the, the chief was saying, because um, we, we all, I say that too, when I think about um, different types of accountability, it's, this is, this is, uh, we need an entire toolbox. We've got some complex problems. So it's not going to be one tool or two tools. We need um, an entire uh, toolbox. And so this is, um, I think, just a great addition uh, to, uh, to the toolbox in terms of preventing um, gun violence. But um, yes, I think that, again, it's a lot of these over-inclusive um, investigative techniques that, um, you know, yes, the li like a license plate reader, if it's, you know, collecting data on every car that goes by, how many of those cars or people in those cars may be engaged in some type of, of criminal activity? Maybe a couple of people, but now you've got this whole database of information. And it's um, actually um, 
even another analogy, um, when I think about some communities that um, have experienced acute gun violence. And so the solution has been, well, let's keep a drone, let's fly a drone over the city um, without any um, community input uh, or, <laughs> or, um, or permission. And we'll just, we'll videotape all day, every day, all of the activity that happens in that neighborhood. And we're gonna focus on that neighborhood because this is where we're seeing um, the problems. And so for, for people, and again, as the assistant chief said, um, it's not everybody in a community who happens to live um, in a community that's experiencing this violence. It's, uh, I, and we know this nationally, is that there's often a number, a, a small number of people who are engaging in the violence, in, in gun violence, and who are engaging in multiple instances of the gun violence. And so while why micro stamping is, um, again, to me, so promising is because it is narrowly tailored um, and it's not just, I, I, I think that is, you know, because after the fact, you're going to be able to see the casing um, as, see, and, you know, see the, the number and, and, tra and trace it back in the crime. But um, it's not just um, at the end after a crime has occurred. This, I think, could have um, a really a, a deterrent effect. It's really important, I think, in terms of preventing that, because if I'm uh, in, a, in a place, in a state like California or somewhere, um, and I know that my brand new um, uh, weapon uh, has this technology, I am going to think very carefully about using that to commit a crime. Not, not to, to use it for any of the, the, the myriad, um, you know, uh, the, the, the legal uh, things that I could use it for and if I need to defend myself or something like that. But if I'm going to commit a crime with it or if I'm going to sell it or give it to someone uh, else to be used in a crime. So I think the deterrent effect is the, also to the, the preventative uh, nature of this. Um, which is, is why, again, if we, you know, if you have this technology, will some of this crime uh, take care of itself? Okay. So we've got some really, I think, some robust questions and answers. We have a couple minutes left. And so let's go, let's move quickly through a bunch of different topics now that the, that the, 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 the uh, uh, viewers are asking me about. Um, so first of all, once somebody asked, well, what are, this is good for new guns. What about used guns? Um, and I think this goes back to, and I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Sure, it's possible to do use firearms. It would require some pretty uh, uh, dense legislation. Um, but I think, you know, with all friends of tools, we're trying to add, add things as we go forward. And right now, we think the number, you know, the types of guns that are used for crime are semi-automatic uh, pistols, generally shorter time to crime. So I think our, our, my goal for this is to get it moving now. Um, let's get it out there in the field. Let's get it. Let's get it deployed, and then we can think about other things. But right now, I think um, we're adding forensic value to the guns that are being sold, um, and that's the place I think that we should start um, drawing lines about which use guns to do and things like that. is, is not necessarily uh, particularly easy. Um, so, a couple of other questions I'll start throwing around. Um, maybe I'll answer one really quickly. One is, what are the obstacles to getting microstamping mandated? Um, the industry complains that they don't know how to do it. They can't do it. It doesn't exist. I think uh, the pictures we showed you shows that it does exist. There's a tool sitting over Todd's left shoulder that shows they can auto automate it. So I think that argument is now uh, out the window. Um, here's some questions that I think um, we get a fair amount. Todd, I'm going to I'm going to throw those to you, and I want people to think about the picture that Ari showed um, that all, that has not only the the, 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 the code, but also some interesting markings around the code, which we call a gear code. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions about Todd about one, can, the, can it be filed off? And number two, can it be replaced? Uh, yeah, I always, always enjoy these kind of questions because uh, it, it, it goes to some, a, basic, a basic theory. It's kind of like driver's licenses, right? I mean, has everyone had a fake driver's license? But we don't throw all driver's licenses out of we're not talking about uh, super genius um, people that commit murders and so forth that would modify the firearm in any way. So the, I always say the simple answer is, if there's a will, there's a way. But um, the, what we've done is put redundancy into the technology. So the eight digit codes on the tip, and then there's a 
surrounding piece, which we call the gear code, uh, which is uh, a binary code, like kind of similar to like a barcode um, that is slightly down from the tip. So if you go and attack it, what you end up potentially doing is rendering the firearm useless. Uh, the, uh, you won't get the, uh, uh, the pin to impress into the primer. Uh, so you basically defeat the technology. The next thing is, I'm gonna just throw, it, throw this forward because I think Josh was there, witnessed this, is we were out in California with CH, uh, at a CHP facility and there was a guy there who basically said, uh, I can defeat the technology in 20 seconds. I offered him, because I had a specific firearm I brought, which is, was a, C, a CHP sidearm that he would be familiar California with. California Highway Patrol. California yeah. Highway Patrol. California Highway Patrol. And I said, here, take it apart. And because I know it takes more than 20 seconds because I'm very good at it and it takes me longer than 20 seconds. And he wouldn't do it. He said, no, 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 I'm not here to do that. I said, oh, look, I'll, 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 I'll do halfway for you. So I pulled the, I took off the pins the way you do it and pull the uh, slide off. I hand him the slide, here, go for it. Once again, he refused. So I said, fine. So I pulled, I went through with my tooling, pulled the pin out. I said, here you go. Everybody says you can scratch it off with an emery board. Here's an emery board. And I, then I said, no, I'll do you one better. I've got diamond paper here, very unique diamond paper. And I had the guy do it. And he scratched it and scratched it. I said, look, go here, diamond paper, hit it, hit it, go for it. And uh, he handed it back to me. I said, are you good with it? And he said, yes. I said, fine. I reassembled the sidearm, put it together, handed it to the range officer. And I said, just fire it and randomly pick up a cartridge. And that's what he did. And when he brought it in, we stuck it under the microscope. And the first thing that we noticed was, well, the gear code was still there. And, and that's the key. That's the hubris of knowledge too. Everyone thinks that everyone's gonna find out about it or something like that. The reality of it is most people who buy a stolen firearm anyways are not con consider, concerned about, okay, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's gonna be traced to them. Um, and uh, so I, I just think it's, it's a non-starter. A non it, this kind of goes, you know, uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, modern firearms are, are not easy to take apart um, and, uh, and to, to defeat them. And, uh, and of course the redundancy we put in place uh, will help it. The other thing is, is that from a forensics point of view, if any type of modified firearms, it makes it that much more unique and which is where Nibin takes over as well. So, like I said, it's uh, a technique it's a piece of evidence or forensic evidence um, or forensic intelligence, uh, but it's uh, very hard to defeat. And, and I would say for certain models, which are now commoditizing, kit, like, you know, the, almost like kits for the, for ghost guns, I think, you know, ghost gun legislation in, is this makes, shows you why ghost gun legislation is so important. I mean, they don't, you know, it's hard, much harder to kit a Glock or a SIG. It's, much, it's easier on AR-15, which most of the legislation we've been talking about isn't doing, but I think the ghost guns is a big issue. Um, we're seeing them more recovered. And I think that, you know, the, it, 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 ghost guns can, you know, too many of them, you can defeat Nibin. So I know there's a lot of ghost gun legislation. Another reason why it is so very important to do that. Okay, I'm gonna run through a couple more uh, questions here. Um, one question says, uh, most pro-gun arguments are not made in good faith, maybe. Um, but um, have we ever won over gun owners with our uh, with the responsible law-abiding gun owners and micro-stamping? I'd say we're looking at the inventor who uh, is a gun enthusiast, that's one. Um, and yeah, and I, of course, we've talked to many, many um, gun owners around the country who are supportive of this. Um, Todd, I don't know if, you know, or anybody else wants to weigh in on that. Um, if I'll, there's- I'll yeah. weigh in on it. Um, I come in contact with a lot of uh, gun enthusiasts and I talk about it openly. Um, a matter of fact, I had a gentleman here, uh, we had got a high power generator and he saw that I had cartridges around and asked me the question and I said, hey, well, you know, I do micro stamp, you ever heard of it? He goes, yeah, I have heard of it. What is it about? And I explained it. And my explanation is this, as a, as a, as a guy who is a gun owner, I always am sick and tired of the, I would say, the 98% plus of us gun owners that abide by the laws, um, uh, defend our constitutional rights, but we're always subject to that leakage of gun traffickers who take their, uh, you know, their right uh, to buy and own firearms and then take that firearm and then claim it's lost and put it into trafficking. 
And so the way I look at it is it's, it's an opportunity for gun owners to say, look, I corral my ammo and stuff of that. I'm not worried about the so-called, I'm at the firing range and some kid is going to come into the range and go on the ground and pick up a cartridge and then all of a sudden commit a crime and then yank out of his pocket something he collected six months ago and scatter the scene and so forth and think I'm going to be tied to it. No, that's not going to happen. The fact of the matter is, is that this is a, I consider it a pro second amendment technology. It's a, it's a way in which the firearms industry could be the tip of the sword working directly with law enforcement and our, in our legal system. And I look at it as a closed loop opportunity in which they can involve this technology like any other law enforcement technology to help, to help people. That's the way I look at it. And when I explain it to people that are, you know, they're, they, that are gun enthusiasts and so forth, that's the reaction I get. They, yeah, I don't see a problem with that. They don't really see it. And, right. uh, you know, doesn't mean that there's some people out there like, absolutely not, but it's a passive mechanical item with eight digits on it. That's, it's not even the serial number. It's a link to the serial number. You know, it's, it's just passive. It's a passive mechanical. All right. that, that's great. Gl glad to hear that. A um, couple, we're going to get some really quick answers here. Um, someone asked, some asked me here, um, is there a market in Europe and Israel and other places? I think the question is, we'll see, maybe. Um, is there opportunities for buyer power? In other words, could states band together and, 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 get, you know, use their buyer power of consumer of buying fire, fire pins or could, D, D, I'm sorry, could DOD, Department of Defense, use their buyer power to purchase micro stand fire pins? I think the answer to that is, is yes. I think those, I mean, that's things are down the road. But the, the thing I want to get across today is this, this technology is ready for that type of volume. Um, it, we're, it's ready. And that's why one of the reasons we released the report today is to bring back to the public how important this technology is. And also the fact that it's, it's not just available, it's commercially ready and a turnkey solution. Um, so um, that's, I, I just wanna make that point. Another point someone asked is, is it possible to mark bullets in, in addition to the cartridge? Um, that's not this technology, but um, the technology that's used here is basic, right? It's basic forensic. Uh, the, these, these technologies of imprinting have been around for thousands of years. Um, so I, you know, Todd, I'm not going to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer this, but I, but there are plenty of ways, I think, eventually that you can make additional um, markings. But the thing that I think is important is that it would be great to have the firearms industry as a partner in this, right, who want to do these things. Um, and right now that they're, they're on the outside trying to stop it, I just imagine if they worked with Todd and some other folks and saying, look, can we, can we really produce a lot more actionable intelligence? I think we get um, a lot further um, along. Um, so... I, th I think um, there's, well, actually, Chief, did you want to weigh in on the, um, did you want to weigh in at all on the on the gun owner question? I don't know if that's something you, I thought maybe you wanted to weigh in on there. No, I just want to say that sometimes uh, we do it in our own profession. People will what if to the point to where you what if to you can't even get off the starting, you can't get off the starting block. Um, and I can say this when we talk about uh, people defeating the technology, I can say this from my experience, when someone is getting ready to, to take a gun to commit a crime, they're not, they're not, I haven't seen the gangs yet that's in a group where they're in a place together and say, hey, did anybody forget to file the firing pin down? Anybody do this? That's not even on the mind when they said, I think sometimes is that we overthink it a little bit because most of those crimes that are committed and the guns that are getting, they're not thinking about those types of things at that time. They're not thinking about, can I defeat this? technology, most of them at that time are thinking about where can I get a weapon, how quick can I get it, and what can I do to actually shoot or kill someone. I think that's what normally happens. The other stuff, what we're looking at is uh, normally a step further out of the system as to where when you're looking at some organized group or organized business that's going to do, you know, try to defeat it, firing pins and different stuff, that's a step before you get, that's a step way before the person has a weapon in their hand. These guys that have, have these guns, that's not even on their mind when they do that type of shooting. Their main thing is how can I elude the police, but manipulating the weapon or anything like that, where it takes that amount of time, that's not on the level what we're type of seeing. And like we said, is that what helps us a lot is that, I think at one time we found that it was over, I can't remember the last step, try to be almost 50% of the weapons that were used and our um, crimes were stolen. 
and they, a lot of them, they weren't reported. They weren't reported stolen. And that's the problem. And you talk to most law enforcement agencies across the country, it may develop, the numbers may vary back and forth, but a lot of weapons are stolen. They're used and not even reported. And it's not, I know in Virginia and most other states, it's not a crime to report your weapon stolen. So your weapon can be stolen, it doesn't have to be reported. So this is where this really helps on a micro stamp. And if we have it, that's an issue. We don't have to worry about going down all that tracking where the weapon is that we already know that the person, we can easily go to them and say, hey, this gun was using a crime and they could come and say, oh, I didn't even report it. it's been stolen this amount of time. So it saves that much more time, that much legwork in the process to get that done. Yeah. Well, I think this has been an amazing uh, conversation. I think the lessons are, this adds a lot of value. I think we should, you know, there's a lot about well, what about this, what about that? But the bottom line is this, I think, adds value in a way that also, in, in, you know, increases community safety and, commun and, and hopefully increases trust between law enforcement and the community. Um, and it's one of those technologies that could add a lot of value without being too intrusive. So we are here to help support this technology along with the, our sister organization, the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. Um, we're very um, interested in supporting this and working with people. And if, if there's other things that we can do to help your advocacy efforts, please let us know. Please read the report and, and, and take a look at it and, and, and free, feel free to email us with questions. Um, and then on behalf of the Educational Fund, uh, I want to thank this great panel and everybody behind the scenes who made this happen. I know that uh, I know that I learned a lot and I'm deeply appreciative of spending some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Josh.